Thank you everybody for uh, joining me this morning. Uh, I'm Tony White here. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent for K-State Research and Extension here in Dickinson County. Uh, we're going to do our virtual wheat plot tour um, because as everybody knows we're having a few uh, few changes on how we hold our programs here this spring. So I'll give uh, everybody else a chance to introduce themselves here on the call real quick. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I am uh, Romulo Lolato, Extension Wheat and Forage Specialist with Kansas State University, based out of Manhattan. Good morning. I'm Stu Duncan, Northeast Region Extension Crops and Soil Specialist. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelsey Anderson. I'm the Wheat and Forage Extension Plant Pathologist. I just started here. Um, in the last month or so, so looking forward to getting to know everyone. And I'm Eric DeWolf, also a plant pathologist, uh, wheat disease uh, expert there at Kansas State University. Thank you, everyone. So first, I'd like to uh, say thanks to our cooperating producers and sponsors uh, for the wheat plots. Um, we have Kevin Harris and Harris Crop Insurance, and then Steve Hoover with Hoover Tarp Sales. Um, They've both hosted the plots here in Dickinson County for many, many years. Um, and then also thank you to uh, our supporters from Extension, as well as the Kansas Wheat Alliance. So I'm gonna go a little bit of background information on the plots, um, how you see it on the screen as far as um, the description with uh, the Hoover plot being on the left and Harris plot being on the right, that will match up with the pictures uh, that you'll see on the slides uh, with the individual varieties. Um, so we'll start um, with the, oh, sorry, let's go back one. The Hoover plot, um, we had approximately an 85 pound seeding rate, um, was planted November 4th. Uh, there was no starter fertilizer on that. Um, typically that field gets some manure applied to it, but it did not this year. Um, 70 pounds of nitrogen was applied at top dress along with finesse. And a couple notes, uh, we've had some strong storms go through um, north of Abilene uh, that has caused some of the varieties to be lodged twice, uh, most recently here in the last week, uh, which you will see those in the pictures. With the Harris plot, um, that was planted on October 18th with a 75 pound seeding rate. Uh, 100 pounds of 40 rock starter uh, was applied at planting. They did apply 50 pounds of nitrogen before planting. Uh, and was worked in, I believe. Another 50 pounds was streamed on around the 1st of March. Uh, a little bit later, they applied uh, finesse and MCPE along with another 10 pounds of nitrogen. And then fungicides, uh, they had a three and a half ounce rate of Nexacor with the herbicide. And then in early May, uh, seven ounces of Nexacor uh, for stripe rust. Um, so with that, we'll move into uh, Romulo and the, and the crew to kind of give an update on some of the things we're seeing around the state. Yeah, well, thanks, Tony. Uh, it's interesting that you have that slide out there, and I'll take the chance to just make a quick comment here because we see the, the seeding rates in pound per acre in both cases, and we understand that for, plot, for, for demo plots like these, it's probably the easiest way we get the same rate across everything. But... Um, just a reminder there that more and more we're seeing these varieties vary considerably in their seed size. So if you get a variety that have uh, 10,000 seeds per pound versus a variety that has 15,000 seeds per pound, well, uh, you might have uh, two thirds of the, po the population that you're intending for if we're not adjusting our seeding rate. So just a quick comment there. Uh, and we, we're going to talk about some of these varieties, their seed size, their characteristics as well as we go through. But uh, as Tony mentioned, a quick update there on what we're seeing around the state this year from the wheat crop, right? And starting last fall, uh, through the majority of the state, uh, we were able to get a decent stand establishment, right? Uh, there was, for the majority of the state, again, uh, kind of some family rains there in the fall that allowed for, for a good stand establishment, with the exception of the southwest part of the state. So in southwest Kansas, we actually... We, we, there, there are several fields that are actually a pretty large region that uh, the crop didn't really come up until sometime in January, right? So in January, February there was planted on time, but there was not never enough moisture for it to really come up and, uh, and, and establish the stand during the fall. 
that really affects that region because then our yield potentials are essentially cut in half right there just because we didn't merge the spring so we might have 50 60 percent of our original potential so that was one part of the story and then uh, through the spring um, that drought that was originally in southwest kansas it kind of expanded to the north central part of the state as well so now we have two very important parts of the state that were under drought stress for a very few, long period of time within the growing season uh, that being southwest kansas and north central kansas as well so uh, drought stress being a, a big portion of uh, the, the story of this year's crop, especially in North Central and Southwest Kansas. Another uh, big talk that we had this year was severe, uh, some very severe, uh, some very cold temperatures that happened in early to mid-April there. Uh, temperatures were, in parts of the state, got to as low as 8 degrees in Northwest Kansas. Um, and so really depending where we were in the state, the crop sustained quite a bit of freeze damage. And so again, Probably the worst portion was that central Kansas through north central Kansas. Um, so Phillips and Rooks, that, that part of the state, uh, from probably from Byron County uh, all the way to that portion of the state where we saw a considerable amount of uh, that combination of freeze that was uh, actually worsened by the drought, dry conditions that we had in north central Kansas. Now the crop more in Byron and Ellsworth County recovered quite well because it had enough moisture to recover. But um, the crop in north central Kansas, it was ne not actually for the next few weeks that, that it had some moisture to really start recovering. So, probably a little bit of a later crop out there because it suffered from that freeze, right? The late planted crops after soybeans were the ones that got hit the worst, didn't have enough canopy out there. So, those cold temperatures really brought the crop, crop back as far as killing some heaters, uh, and it didn't have too many heaters to start with. In the bigger crop, the one that was planted likely either after a wheat crop or after a fallow period, uh, although usually we would expect more damage on that crop and it sustained damage to the primary healers, sometimes 30, 40% loss of those primary healers. Um, you had enough healers out there to really compensate for that. So we're seeing a little bit less damage on, on that crop comparatively to a late planted crop. Um, the central and south central part of the state like from probably uh, Dickinson County is actually in pretty good shape as we go south all the way to Sumner County and west all the way really to about mid -town. So um, the crop is actually in very good shape. It had enough moisture through the season that um, drought wasn't really a concern as we were talking about southwest, north central Kansas. Um, the freeze didn't really catch the crop because well the temperatures were not as low as what we saw in north central northwest Kansas so not as much damage from the from the freeze to that region so really in a pretty good shape in that portion of the state one thing that we started seeing develop just in the last week was really large portions of the, of the field turning uh, white and and that's we can see that it's typically in the low-lying areas of the field especially flat fields and perhaps have just a little bit low-lying area and uh, those large portions that are uh, that are turning white a little bit before everything else, it really seems like uh, in this region, opposite from southwest Kansas, we are seeing some waterlogging really happening and cause large portions of the field to turn white. With that, uh, gives us an indication that moisture was not a in deficit in this part of the state, but that also brings some diseases to the table. And so I'll turn to Kelsey here and see if she has an update for us on disease development throughout the state for this season. Yeah, thanks, Romula. That was a good update. Um, I think from the disease side of things, you're right. The, um, the wet weather, especially in the eastern part of the state, was really favorable for some diseases. I think the biggest story we had in terms of just the number of fields infected um, and the length of time that we were hearing reports was stripe rust. And I think Tony mentioned this in, in the intro that that was showing up in some of these demo plots. And we saw that um, come into the state a little later than um, typical. So that we'll typically hear reports from Oklahoma, Texas, and then we'll start to get reports of stripe rust in Kansas. And so we started to get those reports um, this year in, in late April. And in this part of the state, probably early mid-May, um, stripe rust started to show up in the in the lower canopy, and then we started to get reports of 
of striped breast in the mid canopy. And as a reminder, um, when that when that pathogen affects the upper leaf, so the flag leaf or um, flag leaf minus one, that's when we can start to see yield loss, particularly when um, several plants or or um, or maybe there's foci or like these portions of plants that become infected, that's when we'll start to see yield loss. So um, one of the key things about striped breast this year, although we didn't have the major epidemic that we had a couple of years back, we did see um, several fields infected and we did start to see varieties that had typically been resistant or moderately resistant um, start to have more infection than we would like to see. So those included um, SY Monument, and Zenda, so that indicates that we might be seeing a bit of a race shift. Um, uh, and some of these varieties that were typically controlling the striped breast populations um, might not be working as well. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. So like I mentioned, um, that wet weather was really conducive for some other diseases like septoria and tan spot. Those are the diseases that we um, will see on the, on the leaves that will cause those brown lesions that might all blend together and cause the leaf to die back. And those, those fungi survive in wheat stubble in, in the ground. So when it's wet, those spores will splash up and cause infection. And so um, we were seeing a good amount of, of those diseases, especially in the central part of the state. One of the other big stories is um, fusarium head blight. So it wasn't, um, we're hearing some reports of, of specific fields that are having um, bigger problems, but especially through southeastern Kansas and central Kansas, we are seeing pretty scattered reports of fusarium head blights. So um, again, that's a disease that will infect during flowering, and then you'll start to see symptoms two or three weeks later. So right now, um, maybe in southern Kansas, it's a little late to start to see those symptoms because they can be just totally masked by a mature plant. But in um, central Kansas, we're starting to see those, those wheat heads that have a portion of the head bleached off. So that would be um, fusarium head blight. So we're still keeping an eye out for that and there's still some, some time to do some scouting. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of these diseases and particularly some of these varieties today that uh, are showing to be more susceptible than maybe they have been in the past so we'll, we'll comment a little bit more about that when we're going through some of the, the plot tours today. Eric, did I miss anything on disease? No, I think that sounds great. Well done. Okay. All right, well, we'll move into uh, the varieties that we have in our local plots here. Um, uh, excuse me, Tony, I, I had a question for Romolo. Um, yeah. Is that a, you can edit this out too if you need to, but uh, Romo, you talked about seed size, and as we look at that, um, the the slide that Tony's got up there, you know, as we are planting these and we have these larger seeds uh, in some varieties, that planting date that that could be a really critical for for some of those, uh, like and especially if they're a fall tiller and type of wheat or they're not. Um, uh, you know, I think of Everest, and that was one that we never really wanted to plant too early because, or too late because of that smaller or that larger seed size, and it didn't, it didn't put its tillers on till, um, it, it tried to get them all on in the fall, or as many as it could, and that, that tiller number in the fall is going to be really critical because, what, 60% or better of our yield normally comes from those fall tillers. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Um, sure, yeah, definitely, Stu. Because I think that was a really good point you, you made, and I thought, oh, we could poke that just a little bit more potentially. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. So essentially, uh, Stu, what you're talking about there, so um, remember, the, if we're, the later we're planting, the less temperature we're going to have during the fall. Right, and with less temperature during the fall, that means less tiller during the fall. So essentially, um, uh, the wheat crop is going to produce a new leaf, more or less every about 90 degrees Celsius that it accumulates, and for every about two and a half or three leaves, it's a new tiller. Right, so uh, that we can very quickly calculate and very easily calculate to see how much we're actually missing as far as the opportunity 
for either in goals. Um, and so because whenever we're planting later, we have less time to tiller, that's why we recommend as you're planting later, increase your seeding rates as well. So if we do a quick example here, right? Uh, for example, in the Harris plot there, 75 pounds per acre, that means that if we had 10,000 seeds per pound, we were, uh, that variety was getting 750,000 seeds per acre. Now, if we had 15,000 seeds per pound, that means that that variety was probably getting over a million or maybe 1.1. I'm, I'm not sure on top of my head here, but that's more population that we will be getting in a variety that have uh, 15,000 seeds per pound. So that's the first step that we need to do. It's a variety specific type of, uh, well, just know the, know the seed size. So we're actually not shortening ourselves in population. And then, as you mentioned, as we're planting later, so for example, the Harris plot planted at October 18th had a full, at least two weeks more to tiller out than uh, the Hoover plot. And not only two weeks in time, but also in temperature, because those two weeks were much warmer than the two weeks following the planting of the Hoover plot, plot which was on November 4th. So again, because the crop has less time to tiller uh, during fall, we need to ramp up those seeding rates. So we're re going to rely more on that primary and maybe the first healer, right? The, 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 main, the, the main stem plus that primary healer, rather than having eight or, or, or four or five, six healers during the fall, which are more productive. So that, that's where the compensation comes about, either on the variety seed size and especially as we plant late as well. That, in that situation, planting late, definitely putting out the starter fertilizer is also kind of like, like to call it money in the bank because we really see that response on uh, a little bit better fertility early on, that nitrogen and that phosphorus helping out with wheat healing, uh, which are situations where kind of warranted uh, to apply some starter fertilizer as we're planting late there. So, yeah, good question, Stu. Thanks for bringing well, and, that up. And 15 years ago, that wasn't a big deal because we, we had just started doing our double cropping anyway, and, and that, that is really big in that area north of 56 Highway anyway. For sure. Sure, and, and Tony's right in the heart of it. There have been a lot, a real shift in how, in, in our farming operations. We did a recent survey here and uh, we interviewed about close to 400 fields in North Central Kansas. And you know, we saw that 55% of them were after soybean. So definitely you're right on. I mean, over half, close to 60% actually are going after soybean. So we're pushing our planting dates. So uh, that becomes a much important decision is increasing that seeding rate as we go uh, into a later plant. Thanks, Stu, for bringing that up. So if we're ready, we'll move on to our uh, varieties. So our first one is Everest. Yeah, so Everest, this one has been around since 2009 and needs no introduction in the region. So uh, it was the most widely planted wheat for several years. And who holds a good amount of acreage in Kansas. There are several reasons for that, uh, that success over the years. From an agronomic perspective, maybe some of the things that we can highlight here are that um, it, is, uh, uh, it, it handles acid soils quite well. So sometimes growers that are on that 5.5 pH or lower, um, probably in that 5 to 5.5 range, can trust that it's still going to yield quite well despite those low pHs. Uh, it's, it has an excellent standability, so great straw strength on average steer. Um, it's an early maturing variety, and so it allows sometimes to finish it, finish the cycle before heat really comes in and kind of takes its soul. Its soul. Uh, but a, a lot of the things that made Everest successful over the years were actually related to its disease package. So uh, maybe uh, Eric would like to give us an overview of what has made it successful over the years and what has changed. Sure. I think uh, as we look back historically at Everest, uh, it was largely its disease package, like uh, Romo said, that I think contributed to uh, its uh, durability and, and success over the years. Uh, when Everest uh, first came out, it uh, had some good resistance to leaf rust and the powdery mildew, uh, some of the best available Fusarium head blight and barley owl dwarf resistance, some uh, uh, resistance to hessian fly. Um, now in recent years, it seems like it's struggled a little bit more on the stripe rust side of things and slipped to be at least moderately susceptible to uh, susceptible to um, to the stripe rust population that's present right now. 
Uh, and that's really maybe more than anything else what has hurt Everest uh, in recent years, and, and maybe we've seen it fall off, uh, fall out of favor with a, a lot of growers in, in uh, central Kansas now because of that. It many times will require a fungicide uh, uh, to keep the, the stripe rust under control. Uh, in a big stripe rust year. So overall, pretty solid disease package yet. Some of the best available, Fusarium head blight, barley old dwarf, but keep an eye on that stripe rust susceptibility and be willing to use a fungicide. You may be able to get a little more mileage out of Everest yet. All right, any more comments on Everest? Well, I think we're ready to go. All right, Larry. Stu, want to give us your comments on Larry there? Absolutely. Um, appreciate that, Romolo. This was uh, one of our newer releases. It's been out, is it three years now? Or two, two or three years. But uh, Larry was one of those, uh, came out the same time as Zenda. Probably, <clears throat> if, if, you, if you're going to plant this one up in, Dickinson County, you ought to plan on being ready to use a fungicide application, especially for leaf rust. Uh, Larry does, uh, it's got good low pH tolerance. It's a little bit taller and a little bit later than Zenda or Everest. It, it's kind of in that medium range. Um, has pretty good straw strength. Uh, had excellent yield potential, probably more down in the, the Hutch and Southern McPherson area on west, but it, uh, it has done very well. It does not carry all the disease resistance that uh, Zenda had, at least as far as in, in uh, Everest have. I mean, Everest is still the gold standard, I think, for, for uh, fusarium head blight tolerance, but uh, Larry does not have that advantage. It's, and it's pretty, pretty susceptible to leaf rust. Uh, I'd heard reports, and I'll leave this to Kelsey and Eric, that that Larry has had a little bit more stripe rust this year. Uh, I did not, I just can't find it in my, the plots I did down at Lorraine and Romo, you may, you've seen this too. Uh, you guys have covered more of that, that area of south and west of there than, than I have, but it's, uh, it's been a really good yielder. Uh, we'll, we'll top out a little bit better than Zenda and, and, um, Everest under those conditions, uh, it'll be one of the, the better yielders out there, but you've got to watch the diseases on it. And you also, it, uh, one other thing I like about it is it, it'll tiller pretty well in the fall. And I think it's a pretty decent grazing, uh, du dual purpose wheat. And, and Romo, I think that's something I want you to fill in on some of these because I, Tony, you guys have a, hey, you have a moderate amount of grazing up there in Dickinson County. If the, we do our fair share. Uh, I was looking at the latest numbers from, I think it came out this last week, that we're about number 15 or 16 in the state county-wise for cattle numbers. Um, so we do our fair share of grazing on wheat. Yeah, I guess I can make a few comments here, general comments about what we're looking for in a variety that uh, that is a good dual-purpose variety before, before uh, Kelsey makes her comments on the disease package of Larry here. But usually, uh, Three things that we're looking for, there are several things we're looking for, but a few of them that are from a grazing perspective are for first, good forage production. And then Stu, you mentioned Larry being a very high tiering variety that helps with uh, good forage production here uh, in, in Larry. Uh, relatively medium to late first hollow stem. So first hollow stem remembers that time in the spring when the crop takes on spring growth. The earlier it is, the less time you have the cattle has to graze in the spring. And so being that medium to medium late first hollow stem uh, allows to graze for maybe another 10 days or so. And that might be unrelated from heading date. So it can be a late first, first hollow stem and early heading date variety if it just goes fat, uh, rapidly through that process. And then finally, that it recovers well from that stress that grazing puts on it. So um, trampling of plants, removal of forage, so, so, so recovery, so yielding after grazing is also quite important. So uh, we don't uh, generally measure that too much, with the exception of a couple of trials in Oklahoma where they are actually truly grazing these varieties. So those are good data for us to, to take a look at. And of course, other things that we look for, uh, disease resistance to uh, maybe 
viral diseases transmitted if you're planting early and things along those lines. Lack of, uh, well, good germination in hot temperatures as well. But uh, the main are those three that I mentioned before. So I'll leave uh, Kelsey make some comments on Larry's disease package here before I move forward. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think uh, Stu definitely hit the highlights. Uh, Larry's susceptible to fusarium head blight, unlike Everest. So one to watch out in years that are really favorable for the disease development, like this year, for example, with a lot of water around that um, flowering period. And also the other key highlight is Larry's very susceptible to leaf rust. So um, uh, many of the varieties are more resistant to leaf rust. So in some of these demo plots, if you walk up to Larry, that'll be the first place that you can find leaf rust. Um, better than average for, for stripe rust. So leaf rust is kind of a, a darker rust and it'll be more scattered throughout the leaf, whereas stripe rust is more in orange stripes across the leaf, limit, limited by those veins. So that's how we can tell the difference. And um, Larry has traditionally been, been better for um, stripe rust, but this year we're seeing um, some more than, than we would like. So it's one, that's one we're keeping an eye on for some of the population shifts. Um, intermediate for some of the tan spot, leaf spot diseases. So better than some, but it might be one that um, would require a fungicide in, in high disease pressure years. All right, thank you. On to the next variety, Zenda. So as Stu mentioned, Zenda was also released the same year that Larry was, uh, maybe that was about three years ago. Um, and Zenda comes with a very different background from Larry. It really, it's more of an Everest type of variety there. It in fact has Everest on its background. And so it comes to kind of replace some of those acres that are currently uh, plant, planted to Everest there. Uh, it is a medium early maturing variety. So uh, it's going to be a few days later than what we have in Everest, which is an early one. Uh, it's also more of a medium tall variety. So it's going to be a couple of two or three inches taller than what we have in Everest as well. But Zenda has an excellent uh, extendability, so very good straw strength. We, we've done some uh, intensive management trials where some of the other varieties were lodging really bad and Zenda was still holding up. Although that photo there on the left kind of shows that it can go down as well, especially in, under very high fertility conditions like this plot there that was treated with manure quite often and um, heavy storms. But uh, maybe if you go there a few days, it might be standing up back again. You, overall, it has a pretty good extendability. So, I think it's kind of an obvious choice if Everest has worked well for you. This is one that's been a pretty stable variety as far as yield goals, uh, yield stability, good yielding variety with a good yield stability as well. Um, Kelsey, from a disease perspective, what are the similarities that we have with Everest here and differences? Yeah, so one of the um, one of the the things that makes Zenda a bit better on the disease side is that it has. Um, maybe similar or um, or even better fusarium head blight. So it's kind of that on par with, with some of the best that's available right now in the lineup for fusarium head blight. So that, that makes Zenda um, particularly good. And, and Zenda is better for, um, for leaf rust and stripe rust. So we see kind of a very, what we want to see as plant pathologists, right? If you want to have some of that um, disease resistance right in your seed is a just a very good disease package. So we see Zenda outperform others um, for some of those leaf spot diseases. One of the watchouts would be for wheat streak mosaic. So in some parts of the state, that that's one one watch out. But overall, it's a very very good um, disease package. I think so. Um, comparable to Zenda, but um, to Everest, but I think I think a little better in some of the categories. So it's one we're we're um, we're excited about as as pathologists at least. Um, I would like to point out that um, all the signs in both plots are the same height. Um, so I the way I take the pictures is I try to leave them there at that height so we can kind of see the height differences between varieties. Um, and some of that will show up better in some later pictures. Um, but I thought I'd throw that in on there. So our next well, variety. Another thing you've got is you can you can see the difference in the maturity of the plots from plant. That, that, that's really good. I, I appreciate seeing both of those in there to see how what that two week, two and a half week planting date differential is. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, on to can mark. Yeah, and uh, just to follow up on Tony's comment on the height there, you can already see the can mark is going to be a little bit shorter type of variety than what we're seeing in Zenda, right? And you can see that the sign is considerably kind of above the canopy there compared to Zenda, which was at the, at the canopy level there. So uh, maturity-wise, so can mark has been around for a little bit longer time. I believe it was 2015 that it was released. Uh, it gained some acres in, in central Kansas. It's more of a variety that brings a good drought tolerance to the table. Um, so as we go to western Kansas, sometimes we see more acres of can mark. Some growers love it and have been growing it and it's very successful. Uh, but it, it hasn't taken as many acres as some of the other varieties around. So some things about can mark here, it's a medium maturity variety. Uh, it has a pretty decent drought tolerance that allows it to kind of move out, uh, out west. It has a pretty decent straw strength as well, or as you can see in the photo there, not really, not really lodging. Um, pretty good yield stability as well, kind of like a, a workhorse type of variety that's pretty stable uh, yield-wise. Uh, but because of that, uh, uh, some of the intensive trials that we had, again, because of that uh, straw strength, you can actually take some higher uh, rates of, of nitrogen and still yield quite well. Now, uh, Stu, maybe I'll be a little bit concerned with the acid soils uh, for the Dickinson County region of on Kenmark. What do you think? Uh, I would I would agree, Romulo, and I, uh, it has performed pretty well on those fields. And the only way you're going to know whether you've got acid tolerance or not, or aluminum tolerance, is by soil test. And I. Uh, I know I was running some soil tests in for Tony last week, um, and I hope they didn't bake out in the box, but that's, that I couldn't get into the building or into the <laughs> to the lab at that time. But um, yeah, Canmark doesn't like those those lower pHs in, in Romo. You mentioned once they get below 5.5, five, and, and some of these varieties are even more sensitive than that, I think. I, you, you don't see it, but except when you don't harvest it. It doesn't go across the scales. and and that I, I know with this uh, the plot on the right down at Harris's they they had some well, they had some foss in the starter band so that that can help but that's a band aid but uh, you know and another thing I I always remember with Canmark you you could spot that thing from the highway if you were doing seventy because you can roll it all the way to the end of the season and I, I remember the breeder Allen was was concerned because it didn't look like there was much there but the, there was a lot of wheat in those heads. So, but it, it is a little more upright, and this is one that you can use it as a marker in your plot, Tony. It, it will be standing straight up. If it goes over, it's, it's had real problems out there. So, now, Eric, there's some interesting things about the, the disease side here, right? A little bit different from some of the others. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, Canmark is kind of interesting. It, it uh, represents one of the uh, outcomes of a breeding effort that's been going on at K-State for, for a long time on trying to breed a little more durable uh, resistance to, to leaf rust, dry rust. And uh, so it, it, it contains in its background some wheat uh, lines that are coming out of an international breeding organization called CIMIT uh, that carry forward this type of resistance. So that uh, leaf rust resistance has been fairly stable and, and moderately resistant still on the leaf rust, even though Canmark is getting some age to it here. Uh, but it's never been quite enough to hold the uh, stripe rust in check. And that's probably been uh, uh, Canmark's weakness over the years, may limited some of its utility throughout the state. And in a big stripe rust year, we may uh, are still likely to, to benefit from a, a fungicide application. Canmark's also quite vulnerable to uh, powdery mildew, uh, some of the leaf spotting diseases and fusarium head blight. So maybe overall a little bit weaker on the uh, the full disease package, but uh, some interesting resistance here on the, the leaf rust side of things. All right, so I think uh, we're moving on to, um, oh, got one more kind of oddball variety in here, Paradise. Yeah, so Paradise, it's a, it's a variety that has been uh, actually licensed to Polanski seed uh, there in, in Bellevue, right? Uh, it's been around for a couple of years. We have had the chance to see it uh, for, for two or three years in K-State trials. Um, in central Kansas, it has had kind of like a, a, a variable yield record there in some, in some years stopping some of the trials and other trials kind of being towards the bottom there. 
uh, we're still kind of trying to understand where this one is really going to, to be a good fit uh, around the state. So the yield record has been a little bit ver more variable there than kind of what we like to see. Uh, it's look, it looks kind of like that 4458 type of hat there. It's a medium early variety, medium height. Seems to do well on, on, on acid soils there as well. We can see a little bit of a lodging going on in that left picture there. I think that may be some of the reasons why in our intensive trials we didn't do as well some of the other ones. Perhaps we um, had some lodging in those trials. But uh, Kelsey, I think perhaps uh, some of these years that we had scab might have been the ones that Paradise didn't do as well either, right? Yeah, so Paradise is a little more susceptible, um, especially when you compare it to Zenda or, or Everest that we just looked at, more susceptible to fusarium head blight. So again, if planted after corn um, or in these high disease pressure years, you might need a fungicide. Uh, Paradise is holding up pretty well to striped rust, so compared to some of the others. Um, we've seen it maybe slip a little bit, or we've seen some fields where there's higher striped rust than we would expect, but overall Paradise um, has a pretty good leaf rust package. So for leaf rust, stripe rust, and then um, stem rust. And I think, um, you know, one watch out might be, again, wheat streak mosaic. So there might be a little more susceptibility there. But otherwise, fusarium head blight is, I think, the big watch out for, for paradise when it comes to disease. Thank you. Uh, our next group are going to be the uh, West bred uh, group of wheat varieties we have here, starting with Grainfield. Yeah, so Grainfield is one that has been around for, for several years now. Uh, 2012 it was its release. And whenever you think of Grainfield, uh, it's one of the varieties that has one of the widest adaptabilities around the state of Kansas. Uh, so, so quite widely uh, adapted. It has a pretty decent drought tolerance that allows it to go out west. And it has enough acid soil tolerance. It's not the best acid soil tolerance around, but it has enough of it that kind of does well in most of central Kansas as well. Maturity-wise, grain field is going to be more of a medium to medium late heading, but it goes through the grain fielding period quite fast, and so it finishes it finishes more of it as a medium early variety. And so, and again, it all depends what you're comparing to. As as we go to the west part of the state, grain field becomes more of a uh, medium to medium early variety. And in central Kansas, it's more of a medium, perhaps even medium late comparatively to the other varieties that we have around it. You can see their height, it's a medium tall variety as well. Uh, it has a decent straw strength. It's not the best straw at all, yes, but, but it, it, it's, it's okay for most yield levels. Although we're seeing there a considerable level of lodging in that left uh, hand picture there. So it shows you that uh, uh, in, in very high fertility conditions, it can also uh, lodge and, and, and have some problems there. The yield on this one comes from large heads, so it's a pretty long head. Many times I've seen up to 40 kernels in that head or so, so a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty large and nice head size there. Again, it's one that uh, has a decent yield record, and I'll still kind of keep it there more or less in, in the short lease, and li I like it better as we move more like western from Dickinson County, probably. Saline County, Ellsworth County, and, and West, but still uh, I, I've seen it yield quite well in this more central and east, east central part of the state there. Now, uh, Eric, we probably need to be watching out for the disease package on this one, correct? I think so. Uh, you know, over the years we've had a, a lot of chances to, to see Grainfield uh, over the years kind of mature as a variety, uh, really uh, uh, continue to perform well. Uh, a little bit west of Dickinson County. Uh, a lot of uh, growers seem to like it. Uh, in many years, uh, we've seen uh, some stripe rust, leaf rust really uh, get the better of grain field. Uh, so this is one uh, because of those rust disease vulnerabilities that uh, again may re require a fungicide. It's also not very strong on, on the barley yellow dwarf, fusarium head blight uh, diseases either. So there are some disease vulnerabilities we uh, need to keep an eye on if we're going to uh, to try to go after the the uh, broad adaptability and, and yield potential of a variety like grain field. Forty three oh three. So WB forty three oh three we have had the chance again to see these for a a good three years or so in, in central Kansas. It has a very good yield record. 
especially in those conditions when we're not in the trials that we had intensive management, for example. It, in many of those trials, it ended up kind of stopping the trial. Um, so uh, excellent youth potential on 4303. Some of the things that make it kind of good adaptation for that, uh, for those systems where it's intensively managed is uh, extremely uh, good straw strength. So very good standability there. That straw strength, I mean, it, uh, I don't think I've seen 4303 really go down. And we can, we can kind of see that in the left picture there uh, where Greenfield was really large, 4303 standing. Uh, just excellent standability there. Medium early maturity for heading, although it does, it's the opposite of grain fields. A medium early for heading, and it goes through the grain field period a little bit more slowly, right? Uh, this is one that has uh, that type of large seed size as well. We kind of want to watch out for our seeding rates if we're planting in pounds per acre. Um, again, mostly because it has a large seed size there. Uh, as we move out west, it's a better variety under irrigation, but in central Kansas, under intensive management, it has yielded quite well. Now, Kelsey, that intensive management many times kind of tells us that uh, probably we, we might be, be needing a foliar fungicide there, right? Yeah, definitely. So if we can compare WB4303 to um, Westbury Grainfield, I think the disease packages are pretty similar. So they're both pretty susceptible to, um, to most of our major diseases that we think about. So WB4303 is, um, is very susceptible to stripe rust. So if you start to see stripe rust show up in, in the field, that might be an indication that you would need a fungicide application and also very susceptible to fusarium head blight. So in a year like this year, that, that might um, make a fungicide application worthwhile. So overall, to get the, the maximum yield potential out of this variety, um, you might need that extra input, uh, especially in disease conducive conditions. Four fifty eight. Stu, you've seen 4458 a few times, haven't you? Absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> this has been one of our, our standards up the Central Corridor the last few years. Uh, starting to slip in some popularity. Uh, it, it, it is a variety that handled drought really well. It stood well. It's kind of a, a medium maturity, maybe a little earlier. You can see a little bit of coloring going on in, in on the right, but it's uh, it's it's another one of those large seed of varieties we talked about too, Romolo. I think the, uh, handles acid pH uh, just just was a really good yielder. It was one of the the standard checks that Alan or Dr. Fritz ran in the in our variety trials for several years. Um, it, it just was one of the most popular varieties in the state and, and, and through that area of uh, Dickinson County. Good fall tillers, grazer. Um, it it has some overly or at least, uh, some overly in its background so we got into some of the issues we got into with overly. It's, uh, it's still a very good yielder if you're prepared to to make a fungicide application later in the season for for disease control and I'll leave the diseases up to Eric or Kelsey but uh, I've still always liked this one and it gives you a chance to invest some more money in your varieties later in the season. Yeah thanks Stu. Uh, so uh, the WB4458 uh, has been a nice yielding variety for a number of years. It seemed like it was the the variety to beat in central Kansas and a lot of the uh, breeding programs in the region were using it as a, a check variety uh, to compare modern varieties or, or new varieties to as they just before their release. Uh, Stu mentioned some disease vulnerabilities there probably over the years it's been either leaf rust or uh, fusarium head blight uh, some major susceptibilities for the 4458 that have hurt uh, hurt it some, and, and because of that, it's fallen out of favor as it's uh, maybe some of its uh, yield potential has slipped away in some years because of the late season diseases. Um, we've seen a little bit more stripe rust than historically uh, we maybe would like uh, or have seen uh, with the 4458, but uh, still hanging in there reasonably well. 
Um, so I say watch some of those uh, vulnerabilities to fusarium head blight. Maybe avoid planting it in uh, some really high risk situations, such as uh, planting in the corn residue or wheat residue in an irrigated situation. Uh, you may still be able to get a little more mileage out of your 4458 if, you, if it's been working well for you. So I believe the next two varieties are some new ones um, through Westbred. If I can get the slides to advance, there we go. 4269. Yeah, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the number system here on Westbred with, the, with these newer ones. And the first number, number four, just tells us that it is a hard red winter wheat, so gives us the wheat type. The second number gives us maturity, so two being an early maturing variety. If this was a six or a seven, this would be a later maturing variety, right? Then the third number, in this case, it still did not mean anything, but starting last year, uh, the, the Third number started to tell us the year of release. So uh, if you see the 4699, for example, the next one, the six will tell us a medium late maturing variety and the nine will tell us a 19 uh, variety release. And then the last number here is just a random number generated just to, uh, just to give the variety a, a specific number there. So 4269, the variety that is more adapted to central and eastern Kansas, it has had a very good yield record in K-State trials. So if you look at the last uh, year or two years, really, um, the, the 4269 has yielded quite well. Uh, last year, just, just behind Bob Dole there. Bob Dole was really uh, yielding well throughout the, the region. So this is one that I'll keep an eye on. You know, it, it has had a very good yield record. It has seemed to have a dec decent acid soil tolerance on this one. Very good standability. You can see in that photo on the left-hand side, it's really not... Uh, not lodging. It's an early maturing variety, giving you that option uh, to kind of skate the heat as well. And uh, with that, uh, Kelsey, uh, it might be a good option after corn as well, isn't it? Yeah, so this, this um, Westbred variety is better than some of the others we've discussed. So it's advertised as having that, um, that good fusarium head blight resistance or at least it's moderately resistant so you might see some infection or you might see um, you know your heads that just have one one of the spikelets bleached but it's it's more resistant than than some of the others so that's really promising for this variety and we see that in some of our screening tests as well um, I think this one is also um, relatively uh, resistant to leaf rust and, and stripe rust, although we're seeing a little, little more stripe rust in some of the, um, the USDA screening nurseries that we have here. So sometimes um, sometimes our, our ratings at Kansas State will, will conflict a little bit with maybe Westbred's ratings or Syngenta's ratings, and that might be because we're testing for the local populations here in Kansas where they might have a different a different um, population that they're testing against that might be a little bit older. So we're seeing this one become a little bit more susceptible to specifically stripe rust. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, also very susceptible to wheat streak mosaic. So better than some of the other Westbred varieties, it has that, again, kind of best in class fusarium head blight resistance and good um, rust resistance, but it's one to just keep an eye on. Um, uh, disease-wise, so to make sure that you're out scouting. Romulo, you brought up a point, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, and as we look at uh, these two different planting dates, you talked about escaping the heat. Um, last Friday, when we were cutting Tony's brome, uh, as we left, I saw cows in the pond already at, at before 10 o'clock in the morning. So that temperature was pretty doggone high. Uh, they were not milking very well or they weren't eating either at that point. And at the same time, uh, you know you're hurting your wheat yields. That's kind of an old indicator I got from your predecessor who grew up on a dairy farm. It said if the cows were in the pond, he was losing wheat yield and milk. But once we get you know, those daytime temperatures, what, 75, 80 degrees, it starts hurting us. And if we've had leaf diseases on top of it, it makes it worse. But would you expand on that, please? Sure. Uh, so actually, whenever we, we are both about 80 or so, the crop kind of 
is, uh, it starts to respire a lot, right? So that, that respiration, uh, so remember the crops producing starch, producing sugars with the sunlight, right? And it's expanding sugars through respiration. So what we need is a lot of production of sugars that, that, that that's going to turn into yield and less respiration. So we have that the, the, the end difference there between how much was produced and how much was spent by the end being positive, right? So whenever we start getting to 80 degrees or so, that that difference starts kind of to even out, right? So there's less difference in what the plant's producing versus what uh, it's not. And once we get about 90 or so, sometimes it completely shuts down that production. So uh, what we're losing there or in the effect of yield here is really because then the plant is putting less sugar into the grain, right? Remember, uh, so last week I was at these plots, that plot on the left was uh, getting to that mid milk stage to late milk, whereas the plot in the right was actually already through that like uh, that 4269, that's probably that late soft dough already. So almost that U determination was almost already done on that first on the on the one on the right, whereas the one on the left was still quite quite a ways to, to go. So getting as hot as we are now in a crop that is that late is definitely going to uh, hamper you there, mostly because the crop is going to put less starch into that grain. So really, our grain yield is the one that is affected there, less and more respiration. And so that uh, ratio of how much is produced versus uh, how much is spent goes down. So that's why we result to some higher proteins as well, because just we have less sugar, less starch going to the grain. Good question, Stu. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, walking us through that because I, I know I wasn't very comfortable either. And as the day went along, it got worse. And, <laughs> West bread, forty six ninety nine. So uh, again, if you look at the numbers there, the six tells us a medium late maturing variety, and the third number, the nine, tells us a, a nineteen release, so a release out of last year. Uh, brand new variety out, out of West Bread here. Uh, as you can see, a good straw strength, good standability as well. Seems like West Bread is working pretty hard in that trade, which is excellent. Nobody really likes to harvest wheat, uh, pick wheat out of the ground when we're harvesting it. So that's a pro for this variety, definitely having a pretty good standability. Uh, offers you uh, medium to medium late maturity for those acres after corn as well, as Kelsey is going to comment here with us here in just the uh, just a little bit. Um, now, one of the concerns with this one, again, the area of adaptation for this one is again I 35 and east, so it's more of a central and east and, and eastern Kansas type of variety. Uh, but some of our screenings on uh, acid soil for acid soil, it has shown quite intermediate there to susceptible. And so, uh, not one that you want to put in your low pH sites. Um, with that said, uh, Kelsey, probably another option to go after corn, but on the on the late maturity side. Yeah, good um, fusarium head blight. So a good option after corn, or if you've had fusarium head blight pressure in the past. Um, also, uh, fairly just overall good disease package. So better than some of the other West Bread varieties that we've seen. Um, it's another one where West Bread reports a bit, um, a bit of, of I think a, a better stripe rust package than maybe what we've been seeing lately locally in some of the plots here in Kansas. So that's something to keep an eye on, um, that some of that stripe rust resistance may be slipping for this variety. But I think overall, a good powdery mildew package, a good um, tan spot, septoria package. So overall, this variety should have cleaner leaves um, when compared to some of the others in the plot. So I think that that's a big positive for 4699. I believe this was the last of our West Bread varieties, so we'll move into a couple other ones. LCS Chrome. So LCS Chrome, this uh, so we had a, a later maturing variety, 4699, and this one is another one that fits that category as well, a later maturing variety. Uh, that's my main concern with Chrome, really. I like some of the things on, on agronomics for Chrome. But the maturity kind of worries me a little bit um, because it, it can be considerably later than some of the other varieties in the trial there. 
things that I like about Chrome, they stand, uh, stand up beauty as well. Usually it's on that above average side, although it doesn't really look like that in this plot here. Um, but usually it does have a pretty, pretty decent straw strength. Um, it has a good acid soil tolerance. It has a good drought tolerance. So it's another one of those varieties that, just like we talked about in grain field, has a wide adaptability around the state. With that concern, the caveat that um, that late maturity can hurt it sometimes. Uh, again, kind of getting caught on the heat, right? I mean, when other varieties might be already finishing grain field, this one might still be in the middle of that grain filling period. And so might get caught in the heat. And again, that heat stress might hurt yields uh, towards late, later in the season there. But uh, Eric, Chrome has been one that uh, has done quite well as far as disease goes, correct, over the years? Yeah, I think so. Chrome has <laughs> kind of been an interesting one on the disease side of things. Uh, it does have some nice resistance to some of the leaf spotting diseases, which has been a, a big plus uh, for it as well. Uh, maybe where it's, uh, its leaf rust resistance has uh, been hanging in there really well, so I've been pleased to see that. Maybe where it struggled uh, uh, or we have a little bit of concern would be on the fusarium head blight uh, side of things. I think uh, Lima Green feels it's a little more resistant there than uh, some of the observations that, that I've been able to make over the years. Maybe a little more uh, susceptible on the barley yellow dwarf side uh, in uh, some of the K-State uh, tests as well. So. Uh, there are a few things that we want to keep an eye out uh, on uh, LCS Chrome. Uh, this is one, like Kelsey mentioned at the beginning of the program, that has some uh, appears to be emerging vulnerability to strike rust. So we've seen a few uh, places in central Kansas now where we've seen more strike rust than we maybe like to. I think this is one where we're going to see its resistance uh, rating slip from uh, moderately resistant, maybe in to the intermediate, maybe even moderately susceptible. We'll, we'll kind of see where it falls out here at the end of the year. So if LCS Chrome is, is working for you, as you like to try and mix up your maturity on your wheat uh, that you plan, uh, it's okay to stick with it, but, um, but I, I would uh, keep an eye on it uh, if we get into to stripe rust uh, over the next couple of years. Well, I think we're gonna finish up with um, our Syngenta varieties. Uh, we got a few more of those in here. Very well. Uh, Bob Dole being the very first one. So this is a variety that, uh, as Tony mentioned, it was licensed to Syngenta, although originally it was a, a K-State product. So it was bred by Kansas State University and then licensed out to Syngenta, the AgriPro. Um, so Bob Dole has had an excellent yield record. Uh, so, so in 2017, uh, it didn't do as well as some of the other ones. Remember, we had a very prolonged drought that year, and that hurt it a little bit. So its drought tolerance uh, for that early spring drought has hurt it in the past. But then in 2018, which was maybe a little bit later drought there, and 2019, it had excellent yield record. So it seems like that early drought might slaughter some tillers off of it. And that's what hurt it in 2017. But 2018 and 2019, it had an excellent new record. Really, last year, it was uh, topping many of our trials in the central corridor of the state. So it's one that really very rapidly came to the short list of many of the growers around the state after seeing those results. Um, it has an, uh, a very good yield potential, as we saw it last year. Um, good on acid soils. It is a tall variety, so we need to, uh, to be cognizant of that. It's going to be taller than the majority of the other varieties in, in that plot or, or majority of the other varieties that are available, really. But it usually has a uh, above average straw strength. Now, that means that that combination of being tall and not being an excellent straw strength, just being an above average, we can see sometimes what you're seeing there on the left hand side, which is uh, showing some lodging if the conditions are extremely uh, high yielding. But this is another one that uh, you can also uh, take a look into some extra profit there and like commercializing it not only based on yield but based on quality as well. It has excellent quality profile uh, in the grain so sometimes a little premium there on the protein or even better uh, the actual quality itself on some of those niche programs. So that's, that will be one that I'll be considering very very strongly in those situations. But this one has a large seed size, so just be aware of that as well. Uh, whenever you're putting your uh, seeding rate together, uh, just consider its uh, uh, seed size. 
Kelsey, what about the disease package and what do, do, what are we seeing this season? So I think Bob Dole has a has a good disease package. I think we've seen um, a little more stripe rust again. It's been a high stripe rust year, so but overall, it's compared to others, very very good for stripe rust, leaf rust, and stem rust. Also good for um, septoria and tan spot. So like I just mentioned, for the last variety, this variety seems to have cleaner leaves in general, even when we have high disease pressure in plots. Um, key vulnerability, powdery mildew. So I think even in this, we were visiting this, this plot here on the left and, and there was high powdery mildew pressure. So that's something to watch out for, especially in kind of high yield environments, nice and cool and wet, densely packed canopies, you might see more um, powdery mildew. And also wheat streak mosaic and barley yellow dwarf might show up in Bob Dole more than you would see in other varieties. So those virus diseases are, are some key vulnerabilities. But Overall, a good disease package, a good option, especially if you're going for that, that high quality um, and high yielding variety. All right, moving on to the next one, we have uh, Wolverine. So that's why Wolverine is a brand new release uh, from the, from the AgriPro program there. It's um, uh, actually we saw it uh, last year. I think it was the first time that we saw it and it was 2019 release so it has both wolf and Everest on the background uh, some of the things that we've seen with wolverine so far right so we were still kind of learning on, about this one but uh, uh, pretty good standability usually it seems to stand quite well as you can see in that uh, the photo to the left side there uh, maturity i'm still trying to to find out where this one is going to fit i mean i've seen it being quite late for a heading uh, but I've seen it being more on that medium, medium, early side for a great healing. And so I'm really wanting to, to see it more time so I can actually really place it where it's going to fit as far as maturity goes. Because remember, Wolf was a medium late one and Everest was an early one. And so I'm kind of wondering where this one's going to be. Perhaps it has some photopuric sensitivity as well. That's why we're seeing some difference in maturity there. But, but again, uh, I've seen both sides. I've seen it being on that medium late side for heading. And I've seen it being on the medium early for a grain feeling. So uh, I need to see this more time before I can really give, be more, more definitive there on, on its maturity. One thing that we want to avoid with Wolverine is low pH soils. Uh, it does not handle it quite very well. So unfortunately, we got that trait from Wolves and not from Everest. So it's one that we need to be, to be cognizant of that. So probably more of a central and western variety type of variety here rather than central and east. Probably for Dickinson County, we might have better options there. But uh, Eric, what are we learning this year from Wolverine from the disease package? Yeah, we've uh, just been able to get some of our own disease observations on it uh, just this year. So it, things are kind of taking shape for us as well. Uh, maybe we've seen a little more uh, vulnerability to, to stripe rust than we'd like for a fairly new variety. I mean, that's nothing uh, too surprising given Everest vulnerability and Wolf's vulnerabilities, two of its parents. So uh, I think we're going to need to watch that on Wolverine. Interestingly, it's still hanging in there quite well, moderately resistant to leaf rust, so that's been encouraging. Um, it's the other thing we're curious about would be uh, how well Wolverine stood up to some of the leaf spotting diseases like tan spot and septoria. And the reason is, remember Wolf, uh, one of its parents is a variety that was known uh, to have better than average uh, uh, resistance to the leaf spotting diseases. And uh, from some of our preliminary observations, I'm encouraged there. I feel like uh, maybe we we are seeing some evidence that Wolverine is going to bring some of that leaf spotting disease resistance forward, which could give it some uh, a little more utility and weed on wheat type of acreage. Uh, on Fusarium head blight, uh, barley yellow dwarf, uh, I don't think Wolverine is going to be anything special. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to have to keep an eye on, on those vulnerabilities. So a few vulnerabilities to keep your eye on. Uh, I'm mostly concerned about that uh, stripe rust susceptibility. Uh, so uh, let's give Wolverine a chance use a fungicide if we need to, and uh, see where this takes us. Thank you for that. Um, monument. So SY Monument, Stu, we mentioned quite a bit about the double cropping wheat after soybeans there, uh, and this one seems to be one that growers like about it. So what do you think about Monument, Stu? What are your, your take on this variety? 
Well, uh, the growers do like have like this one. It it was, it's, if not the top variety in the state, it's been one of the top two or three for several years. That one in Greenfield, both uh, a lot of good tiller and ability in the fall. So I mean, whether you're double cropping late or going for grazing early, it seems to be a really good good all around wheat and pretty good drought tolerance it tends to if you over manage it it may lean a little bit it, it's it's still got a pretty good straw strength on it as the most part but and it's uh it's kind of a medium height and, and again one of those medium but or maybe an early medium to medium maturity but it's been a real it's been just really solid in that central part of the state and even further west a little bit. A really nice fit, uh, does well, uh, uh, um, fits well on the the pH side of things and has been a really good yielder. It, it's just had a lot of good qualities and it's made it a really solid wheat for our growers. I'd have some, mm -hmm. unless, except for my farms in Osage County and it would just fall apart. Everything falls apart in Osage County. <laughs> what about its disease package, Kelsey? What are what are we seeing this year with Monument? Yeah, I think probably one of the reasons that it that it performs really well is that it has a good disease package, particularly um, when we're talking about leaf rust, stripe rust, hand spot, powdery mildew. So again, the the leaves of this variety will look very clean even in a high disease pressure. Um, situation. Now, this year, however, we're looking at some of our data and some of the visits that we've been doing to um, field sites, and we're seeing more stripe rust again, like we were for um, chrome on SY Monument. So um, it's something to keep an eye on now. So if it's historically, you have not had to use a fungicide to control stripe rust on SY Monument, that might be a concern um, moving forward. Another key just red flag for SY Monument is it is susceptible to fusarium head blight. So it's something if planted after corn and in a year where the weather is conducive, it might need a fungicide application to kind of control that fusarium head blight issue. But other than that, um, still looking like a solid disease package overall. So on to our last variety, and that is SY Benefit. Yeah, so SY Benefit, we've seen it for at least three years now. Um, it was released as a variety that would be better adapted to I-35 and East, so kind of like a central and, and eastern variety there uh, with a decent low, uh, low pH tolerance. So that is a trait that we look for in that part of the state as well. Um, also, I believe they were mentioning Benefit having a little bit better uh, scab tolerance than average, so probably Eric can talk to us about that here in a little bit. Uh, the main thing, we haven't really seen benefit yield as well in our trials as some of the, the other varieties. So even in central Kansas, if we look at its yield record for the last three years or so, it has been kind of towards that, uh, the lower end. And so uh, although I think it, it might have some uh, characteristics of, of interest there as a, like a, a earlier maturing variety, it's an early to medium early variety there, uh, good million and baking, uh, characteristics on, on benefit, good acid soil tolerance. Just the yield record just isn't very solid. It's been basically towards the bottom. And that concerns me, of course, because at the end of the day, yield is what growers are looking for. Uh, but uh, Eric, any comments there on benefits disease package? Well, I would agree that I think benefit uh, has struggled a little bit over the years. Uh, probably uh, the thing that Syngenta really liked about it at the beginning was uh, it's adaptation for eastern Kansas they felt and and then uh, also some uh, intermediate levels of resistance to fusarium head blight. So uh, I'm encouraged overall that we're getting more and more varieties that have uh, intermediate to moderately resistant uh, reactions to fusarium head blight. Uh, but uh, I think out of our lineup I might choose something like uh, the Zenda or 4269 out of the Westbred program. Uh, over the SY Benefit just because of their more consistent yield performance. Uh, SY Benefit we've seen uh, really get uh, hit hard by leaf rust in a couple years now and uh, also uh, a little bit weaker on, on some of the other foliar diseases. So um, I think there, there may be some better things even within that Syngenta lineup uh, for you to consider 
um, for uh, this portion of the state. All right, thank you for that. Um, that was our last variety. So if we have any more uh, comments from anybody on here or questions. Stu, do you have anything to add or are you good? I'm good to go. It's uh, we just need to. I think we roll along. We're probably going to see some some test weight dings here on on some of the stuff that came a little later, but we'll see what happens. That means high protein, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. With, with this heat that we had last week and and today's supposed to be pretty hot as well. I believe on the 9th of June we're supposed to be a little bit cooler there, so hopefully that helps a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that we lost some yield already, and and we're actually uh, calculating the number of hours that we had above those thresholds. We can put a short output together on that for growers. So. Right. Are, are, Tony, you guys are expecting rain tomorrow. Or there's pretty good chances for rain tomorrow night. Is that correct? I think I I look like the central part of the state. That that's going to cool it off some, but um, there are some areas that especially those later planted, I think we could still use some some moisture. We're getting a little, starting to get a little short on Roblo. Is that what you've been seeing too? It, it would not yeah. hurt to have another shot of water. Yeah, I think, I mean, as we go to south central Kansas, southwest Kansas, the crop's pretty much getting to where it's not going to benefit. And by that, I mean like Sumner County region. Uh, at least I was there last week and I was giving it five, six days before the combines were going to roll in that part of the state. So we're probably not going to see any yield benefit in that situation. But uh, from, uh, I've seen some fields in McPherson County that were still in that uh, mid grain feeling that a rainfall could still benefit. So from there north, uh, yeah, and NOS especially, some rainfall could still benefit use there. So uh, definitely if we had some now on the ninth, that would be quite beneficial. It's a big turnaround from last year because about this time last year, our office was surrounded by sandbags in preparation for potential flooding. Um, and now we're asking for some rain. So <laughs> big change from last year. But, well, if that's all we have, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me this morning to uh, record our wheat plot tour. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. And, and we're all getting this organized. Thanks, Tony. And everybody else. <laughs>